ninth talk in our series, which uh, is an amazing achievement. All, all the other eight are actually on our website where you can watch them uh, for free if you missed them before. So this is the last and final, um, and we're now, Anthony today is going to talk to us about post-colonial landscapes of Africa and Asia. Uh, searching for common ground in the gardens of the past, transition and transfiguration in the post-colonial landscapes of Africa and Asia. Um, and also um, in this talk, he'll focus on the buildings of the Commonwealth interwoven with the development history of the landscapes of which they form a part. Just to tell you a bit about Anthony, um, he's a horticultural scientist and professional landscape architect based in Cape Town in South Africa. And his work encompasses world heritage sites, city parks, major urban mixed space development projects, conservation landscapes, historic gardens, and the landscapes of wineries, race courses, marinas, and destination resorts. Um, currently, he's a landscape director of Planning Partners International in Cape Town and a senior landscape consultant to the Aga Khan Trust for Culture Historic Cities program. He's also been an examiner in the LA, M, sorry, MLA programs at the University of Pretoria in Cape Town and has also lectured at the University of Cape Town. So I think we'll hand over to Anthony now um, and welcome him to begin our final talk in the series. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes, perfect. Okay, great stuff. I'll start by welcoming you personally to Cape Town on this cold night. I really wish, uh, wish I was uh, with you in person. Uh, I'm actually going to speak to you on a narrow field in the sort of development of Commonwealth landscapes, which is new parks for old Africa, adaptive redevelopment of post-colonial heritage landscapes in Zanzibar, because that stretches over three different, three or even more different projects I've worked with within the same sphere of the old town in, uh, in Zanzibar itself. Just so uh, everybody, for everybody to check that we know where Zanzibar is. So it's just off Tanzania and there I marked it with a red dot. And um, Zanzibar itself, is name, its name is Unguja uh, and Stone Town is the red dot on the, uh, the Western side there. Uh, but Zanzibar and Pemba, the other island, are considered you know, a pair of islands and they have quite a unique history being defensible just off the coast of Africa. And so they attracted all sorts of uh, good, good work from sailors to actually sort of you know, save their lives and provide fresh water. Um, and they provided also opportunities for more nefarious purposes because they were a refuge. So sometimes a good place, sometimes a bad place. And in particular, we're going to focus on uh, the Foradani Seafront, which is part of Stone Town. Now, Stone Town is a remarkable place. It's an urban relic built out of coral, cloves, and the blood of slaves. 50,000 slaves annually at its height uh, went through in the process. And David Livingstone's estimate was more than a further 80,000 slaves died even before they got to Zanzibar. So it had a ferocious economy. It was incredibly rich and it had the power and energy to build palaces across virtually the entire seafront, uh, a little bit like a modern day uh, Middle Eastern country. Uh, it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2000 and still hangs on to it today somewhat precariously, but it's always severely tested by not necessarily maintaining what has been uh, restored in the past. And so it actually comes and goes uh, in, in fashion. What has actually uh, managed to save it is a very loyal uh, tourism industry, and starting originally actually with uh, the British, but then morphing into Italians and other uh, European uh, 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 visitors. And they have actually um, recognized that the heritage in the city itself has an immense value to intellectual tourism and just simply to sort of beach tourism. So it's a blend of the two. Uh, just to give you a little background quickly on this slide, just generally, and then I'll just free, free talk afterwards. Stone Town began as an East African beachfront fishing village um, in about uh, 1107. Uh, Vasco, de, uh, Vasco de Gama sort of sailed by, by it once and recognised it as Jangi Bar. Um, it was obviously a sort of an area for slaving, if everybody knows that in historical terms. 
and it was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site for all those reasons. It was not one single uh, recognition of a, a quality. It was actually the fact that so much intense urban development and so much intense uh, historical record have been actually preserved in one area, especially in this incredibly humid tropical area, which where the, the, the rain, rainfall and the, uh, the weather and the humidity eats buildings, eats timber, even destroys stone finally. So the fact that anything survived there is remarkable. And what we were involved in was the adaptive restoration of the slavery area wharves and warehouses along the seafront, the sea wall itself, and a colonial park, turning it into a multiple per multi-purpose public promenade and a tourist attraction without losing the vigor and the authenticity of its historical record. And that was most important. And that's what attracted the sort of uh, the support of UNESCO in this endeavor. Um, folk, the focal point of the entire seafront, now along that rather bad blurry picture along the bottom, is a complete um, view across the seafront of palaces, an Amani fort, uh, multiple sort of mansions, uh, gigantic mosques in the background, uh, uh, European churches, a whole gamut, even a Roman Catholic church perched in the corner. So every culture met here, it was like a melting pot, uh, many languages, uh, many activities going on, but a, a, a sort of cohesive community evolved out of this mishmash of passing seafarers and other people trying to make a fortune out of the visit to the Spice Islands via this island, which gave them a stopping off point. And in the background there, which is a World Heritage Site, as you can see in the, in, the, in the notation, but the focus of the World Heritage Site is the actual seafront itself, which you can see in the picture with the sea wall there, and what they call the House of Wonders in the background. And it was called the House of Wonders because it was the first building in Africa to have electricity. It was the first building in Africa to have a lift. It was the first building in Africa to have almost anything, including electric street lighting all the way along the beachfront, probably long before you had it in many other countries. So it was quite remarkable that this item was chosen for all these firsts. And it's had a very vibrant and active port uh, across a multitude of um, uh, I think offerings from a, a commercial point of view. But as you can see there, it has aged, it's aging. And it was aging to such a point in 1997 that the previous 300 years of uh, uh, historical development and heritage had begun to virtually disappear. As you can see there, there's corroding, corroding paving, the sea wall is fa uh, uh, falling down. What was once a city park right in the center outside the House of Wonders and previously had been a slave market. And before that had been a, um, a marching ground for soldiers. Um, um, it had uh, acquired quite a patina of decay, which in some ways was charming, but in other ways was becoming actually downright dangerous as the sea wall itself began to fail and collapse in part. So it had once been a park in, Vict in Victoria, late Victorian times, uh, and it once be, had been an arboretum. It had been many things, it had been a public park. And right next to it, you can see uh, the old uh, Amani Fort, which was the primary sort of military uh, uh, building in, in, in Stone Town itself. So there's, there's many cultures here and there's many fragments and layers, a bit like a classical palimpsest, which historical people love to, uh, uh, you know, appeal to, uh, this is it, this is it, but it was falling apart. So these photographs give you an idea of what it looked like in 1895, when it was actually a very vital place in the British Empire. Uh, originally, it was actually, the Sultan was being sponsored by uh, the Germans, and there was constantly a battle between the German uh, sort of fraternity and the British fraternity to who was going to woo the uh, uh, the Sultan to their side and to actually focus trade in their own in their own backyard. So this is what the House of Wonders looked like at that particular time. As you can see, it's very grand. It was actually uh, part part palace and part harem. But then came the shortest war in history, because eventually things had to be sorted out between the British and the Sultan and the German influence. And you see there in the top corner is the British fleet with three cruisers ready to go. And uh, they eventually 
uh, bombed uh, or with a salvo of ammunition from the uh, cannons of the, uh, the, the British ships, bombarded the entire seafront to the point where the Sultan's palace fell down and only the clock tower was left standing and that fell down afterwards. Uh, and it was not a fair battle. I mean, the British had three cruiser ships and the Sultan only had uh, one, one yacht given to him, I think, by the British government at some stage. Uh, and he'd used that as a just a, a pleasure vessel. So it was a really a one-sided battle. And then he fled to the German side and disappeared. And the British took over the general sort of uh, organization and running of Zanzibar. So, so much history in such a small place. That's what the, uh, the waterfront looked like once it had been bombarded. You see that the, uh, the uh, lighthouse is still standing at that moment in time, but it was to fall down shortly later. Uh, there, the triumphant uh, British crews uh, now installing themselves on the waterfront. Um, and everything you can see there was, it was, it was a parade ground at this point. But before that, it had been slave yards. And before that, it had actually been a marketplace. So there were many layers of history embedded here. And this, for these reasons, uh, everybody saw merit in actually restoring it in a way that could be understood and analyzed, but also become part of the, uh, the city fabric or the town fabric of, of, of Stone Town itself. Because it's not only for the tourists, it's not only for the academics, it was for the uh, people who actually lived in Stone Town. It is their front yard. They don't have gardens. They only have public parks and they have very narrow alleys and they have the beach. And the beach is a very small beach. So in fact, there was not much public amenity. So all those had to be blended together, even in these times at the end of the, uh, uh, this, this uh, period in, in British history, where it had to actually then become a public park for everybody. The British then, at that point, rebuilt the House of Wonders, so you can see it there, uh, with its electric lift and all other sort of facilities. They made a very elegant formation of it there. They used cast iron pipes to recon uh, reconstruct the facade. They built a new gun battery across the front of the uh, seawall there. And you can see at the seawall at that moment is made out of rough stonework. And the building at the left-hand side there is a Sultan's Landing. And that's where the Sultan's barge, the one I was referring to, could actually go out into the, uh, into the ocean and actually travel along the, uh, inside the coral reef to take the Sultan to his uh, various holiday palaces further up the coastline. And at this stage, there's very little vegetation in the area. It's very much a civic uh, place and an expression of control and uh, the, the nature of you know, who's in charge now. And in the top, top uh, right hand corner there, you can see the Sultan's barge. And that was a gift to him, I think, uh, by the British royal family, uh, possibly made in India, but with some additions made in the Isle of Wight, which we noted when we actually took it apart later on. And we'll see that later on in this presentation. So this is what's going to now become, over time, this new sort of green center of the town. The heritage is, is a problem in Zanzibar, as I've said, it, it declines very quickly, sometimes very slowly. And here you've got the original sea walls actually crumbling and with uh, a collapse in their fabric uh, because they're being eaten or eroded from the sea underneath or being overwhelmed by sand or the total collapse of all the concrete work that was done in sort of around the 1920s was done with reinforced uh, concrete, steel reinforced concrete very poor steel. So all the steel reinforcing in the, the balustrades, very elegant balustrades and street lights and whatever, has actually blown apart because of the, uh, the, um, the erosion and the rotting of the salt water on the reinforcing. So what was a very elegant place then became a totally depauperate place and started to crumble into the sea. Worse still, because these buildings were only very lightly built when they were originally built a couple of hundred years ago, uh, and they are actually part uh, stone uh, with a very sort of rough cement made out of burning shells to actually give you some cement and then actually to turn it into a semi form of concrete, but not reinforced, and then exaggerated with sort of a coral plumstone, which they plug into it. It was a very light structure. 
And as time went by, these three and four storey palaces, and they were all palaces along this sea edge, started to collapse. And this, one of these collapses just happened as we happened to be working there, doing the initial uh, investigations into what was conservation worthy and what techniques we could, we could use and what uh, materials when one of the buildings fell down. So that was quite a surprise, the first time that had ever happened to me on site. We, we had to take a sort of town planning, urban design and landscape architectural view to this entire stretch of the uh, seafront. And it was reliant upon, in fact, if you had to repair anything on the landward side, it was only worth doing it if you repaired things on the seaward side, because the landward side of the island, the landward side of the, of the town, is actually not viable without the protection uh, from the sea, the waves, and the general elements uh, of the site. So it's, 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 it has heavy, heavy rainfalls. I mean, really incredible monsoon rainfalls, which almost wash away stone, let alone sand and lighter materials. So everything was actually prejudiced by the humidity, prejudiced by the rainfall, the leakage of roofs, the collapse of buildings. What happens here, because the buildings are so lightly built, uh, they're made, made out of mangrove poles, um, infilled with woven uh, branches, and then covered in a sort of this concrete material with a tin roof on top, which is not the most robust of combinations, but it gets to a certain point where the, it, it just can't stand up anymore and they tremble slightly and they collapse. And I was told this story by local people and they couldn't demonstrate it to me, they couldn't show it to me, but they could show me places around the actual stone town area, including our site, where buildings had collapsed and there were just big piles of rubble. So we began to understand what the problems were. What we looked at, and this is a, this is a sort of a, a plan looking forward to what we thought we could do, is we could repair the seawall all the way from Forodani Park, which is on the left-hand side, with the pier that goes out, which I think was visited by uh, Princess Anne at some stage, probably in the 50s. Um, and that had previously been a public park of paving and lawns and trees and plantings. And very much we wanted to keep that as a public garden because as I said before, most people in, in Zanzibar don't have a garden. And so this becomes their public garden. And then to extend rows of uh, plantings, avenue plantings, and originally they were thought by some American landscapes that these should be uh, canopy trees, tropical canopy trees, evergreens. Uh, but it was thought eventually that they would hide that long view from the sea, that vista, which you saw in the first slide, would disappear behind those trees. And that wouldn't help actually capture the value and the original feeling of the bare um, walkway that used to happen in that area. So it was rethought. So you now have a garden which is connected to a uh, walkway along the sea's edge, and there was going to be planted with a avenue of palm trees. And then there's a big green tree on the right hand side there, which is a tree planted in 1942 by uh, one of the uh, one of the leaders in the in the area. Uh, which is a, a people tree, and that was put in a sort of as a religious significance or a particular event. And again, all this was going to contribute to the restoration of the park, which is in part built for um, George V's anniversary. Uh, I think it was, I'm not sure, 50th anniversary. And it was also then built for the uh, one of the sultans in the area who was still actually being on in good faith with the British. And so it was a park for two religions, and it was an area for everybody in the city, no matter what your religion you were. And there's a Roman Catholic church at one end, and there's a Christian church at the other end, and there's many, many mosques in the middle. So this had to be a landscape for everybody. And that was actually sort of drilled into us. So we focused, first of all, as a first phase on the park, not only to actually give us some confidence from a sort of design point of view in a tropical country with a peculiar sort of arrangement with the sea, uh, and the closest of proximity of all these monuments, but to actually sort of find a way to actually satisfy the expectations or aspirations of the local people and to make it actually a workable piece of tourist infrastructure and actually just general metropolitan infrastructure, because this is the main road through the, you know, the main city. And so it had to work to actually transport traffic down to the port, which is on the far right hand side of this diagram. 
So it had to work for an economic reason, but it also had to actually reproduce history and it had to be a place where people would actually go and live general, you know, their general life. Uh, a place to go and actually fall in love, have a picnic, uh, promenade and do all the things, in fact, swim at high tide. And this is like a, an internal swimming pool almost to Stone Town. And all the young people go there because it goes from being a very thin beach to being three meters of clean water. So it's actually quite a spectacular lead out. And we got down to grassroots because um, we had to explain to the local people that could be a consultant from South Africa is uh, what we wanted to do. And they didn't want to lose their food market, which they had, but was in a very poor condition, very unhygienic. And it would produce an enormous amount of uh, waste food and invited rats and all sorts of problems. Even though tourists quite liked it, you liked it in the evening when you couldn't see what was happening around you. But in the daylight, in the morning, it was like a bombsite. And it was really not acceptable to the municipality. It was not acceptable to the, the city management that they could have that. So what they asked us to do was try and explain to the, uh, the local people how it could be made better in very easy ways. In just to point out certain elements of how to make hygiene in a public place and a public park, which is multi-purpose, how to make that function better. And you see there the solid waste strategy done in cartoons, because obviously our ability to speak Swahili was very limited, but we needed to help actually transfer a message. And it was to identify appeal, identify causes of delay, change patterns, train people, so people were brought in from Egypt who could speak Swahili or speak in the Muslim uh, language where they would actually be understood and then continue to generate income because it had to, again, serve everybody and it had to have many functions. Um, and we were jibed by some people by saying, well, you mustn't draw uh, cartoons for Muslims. But in fact, this worked. This actually worked to treat and the, the quality of the food and the quality of the food market now is one of the sort of strongest points of the, the economy, in fact, of this park, which you never possessed before. So quite a revelation there. From a horticultural point of view, because that was my original focus, I was horrified by the fact that the ground around the trees, the park had become so worn out and so overused and so overwashed by these heavy torrential rainstorms that our, all the topsoil had disappeared. And these wonderful specimens of tropical trees and these wonderful elements of this you know, bandstand and all these other sort of things put in in the colonial times were just actually their whole setting had been lost. And to do that, we thought, well, the first thing to do is to save the life of every tree we, can, we possibly can do. So we immediately had them fenced off. We brought in a relatively small amount of topsoil in the beginning just to stabilize them. And we planted the local tropical grasses around them to stop the soil being washed away by the torrential rain. And that alone was probably one of the cheapest and the best steps we ever took. I mean, we'll take it one step further in that we tried to liberate the, the roots of the compaction which had happened in previous years from this torrential rain and this hammering of the wet soil. That's how when you want to compact something, you hammer wet soil. So we put in air drains, radial air drains into each of the old trees and actually brought air back to them first. And in the dry period, water can go in through the same way. And that is a way you can rejuvenate trees, even the soft tropical species. And that work to treat uh, was at a very low cost and done by local people. So we started to employ gardeners on the site to do work which they knew how to do anyway, because everybody in Zanzibar is a gardener. And there were also interesting in other things happened which we didn't quite predict. So we knew there was a problem with the collapse of the seawall and we knew we were going to rebuild it. And we started to rebuild it and design blocks, reconstituted coral concrete blocks, which you can see they're demonstrated on the right hand side, with reconstituted coral um, paving, exposed aggregate coral paving, taken from old coral pits, not new coral, but old coral pits in the center of the island, and actually used to actually make it an authentic finish, an authentic surface for what is a, a, a proper her heritage place. What we didn't know until we'd been there in a very sort of high tide, spring high, is there was a man in front of me actually at one stage, he was laying blocks in the water, trying to lay blocks and actually uh, to uh, put water in them under the water. 
And we were saying, well, what, why are you doing this? Have we got the levels wrong here? And what it turned out was, in fact, rising sea level had gone beyond the old wall. Let's, let's call it the Victorian sea wall. And was actually now coming over, which just proves that you know, the rise in sea level is real. And it was affecting Zanzibar. So we, at that stage, we had to stop the job. And we had to go to the authorities and actually ask them if we could get a special permit to now then change the levels of the historic park. And I had to go to UNESCO, had to be referred to UNESCO to get the approval that we were allowed to erase the wall there. And if you look at the, the bottom uh, uh, right hand uh, picture, where the guy is sitting on the wall with his Wellington boots and yellow hat on, is the original seawall is the bottom layer. The next piece is the new seawall fillet we had to put in, which is 450 of uh, new concrete, which lifts it out of the water level. And then the new line of concrete blocks along the top, which are not original, but they're an effort for us to actually give another level of protection to the park from uh, you know, encroaching seawater. And it's like a wave breaking, breaking system, but in the same manner or character of the seawall. But the new work had to be distinguished from the old work. So there's no confusion what was original restoration, which is a lower green part. And this is the new part, which has begun to weather even now very convincingly. So in order to protect the park and stop the salt water, which is also part of the problem, which we didn't know about, going into the park and killing the trees because they don't like the roots in salt water. And every so often, something else fell down. So this was the outside the House of Wonders. You can see its, uh, its, its pipes and, and columns there. And so every so often, it's such an old place that something would fail and not only endanger people's life in the street, but actually damage or shake the confidence of what was happening from a, a stabilization and construction point of view is, why weren't we working faster? Why weren't we dealing with more buildings? Why weren't we dealing with more infrastructure? And it's been, a, it's been a problem throughout the entire project is we began with a park project and a promenade project, but then the entire city needed to become the project. Um, we went back to first principles because we were working in a public place and we actually uh, had organized with uh, people who did speak uh, the local languages to do uh, visitor investigations and to actually uh, to quiz the public, not only the not only tourists, but people who lived locally and people who actually worked in the area, if what, what were their expectations? What were their feelings about the park? What was their input from a desire line point of view? Is what would they like to see in the park? And that was that was something of a revelation, is because they were they were very um, uh, they were very moved by the fact that this park where people have been, you know, they, people used to go there for their marriage photographs, they used to go there for their photographs where they had a kid. Uh, or when anything happened in their family, because they didn't have gardens and they lived in very tight housing or apartments on the street, then they would actually go to the park in its former glory of green lawns and clean uh, flower beds and shady trees. And that's where they would have their family picnics. That's where they would have their birthdays. It was, it was a very special place. And that came through in the, uh, the comments that local people made and they wanted it restored. They didn't want it overly changed. So it was a social needs and desires exercise, and that was well worth it. And because it was translated to English, we could all benefit from it. Um, and then we engaged with the local artisans, because what was also remarkable is there were many local artisans who still had the ability to work with stone, here the coral stone. Uh, there were lots of people who had ability to work with gardening and farming, because they'd always been involved with that. So the uh, restoration of the, uh, the little uh, bandstand in the center and other new, uh, elements, which was new, but recycling old things, like the cannons we're putting in there in that picture is because there was a, there was a cannonade on the site. Uh, and that, was a, that had been there as 12 cannons, I think, at one stage. And they went down to sort of six at one stage. I think we, we scrounged around and found about five cannons from police stations which we actually negotiated to take. And we put the cannons back on the, uh, the, uh, the wall edge because that was a memory which people had always had of the site and they wanted it restored. And as you can see on the, uh, the left-hand side there, uh, the way we actually rebuilt the sea wall was to rebuild blocks which look like their old stone, 
but not entirely like old stone. They're clearly different, and you can see where the old and the new change in the bottom pictures. But there's a certain there's a certain synergy between them. But it's not pastiche. But we had to build a coffer wall outside in pure concrete to actually allow us to work for 12 hours a day uh, to actually get this entire exercise finished. And that was quite something because sometimes the waves came straight over the, uh, the wall and they damaged what we'd done before. But all this was integrated and all this process was part of this, this uh, big project we were working on, essentially organized by a, a landscape architect or a landscape planner, but with engineers and electrical engineers and all sorts of coastal engineers involved in it, but all working towards a landscape theme uh, and a, a theme of sort of perpetuating what was the natural or the old historical elements of the site. So very exciting and a bit risky. And this is a terrible photograph, but this was the most exciting moment in the entire project is we brought back the topsoil. So truck after truck after truck of topsoil, red topsoil, which is degraded sort of coral basically, was brought in from areas outside, degenerate field areas no longer used, and we re everything back to what it would have been when it was in the, uh, the earlier times and had beautiful gardens and big tropical trees. How the tropical trees here survived, I don't know, but I do know actually because we actually gave them air and we gave them water and we gave them, uh, we gave them soil. But there you can see already the actual tree canopies of those big old uh, majestic trees have already sort of started to romp back. We thought we'd lose most of them, but we actually succeeded with about probably 70% which is quite encouraging. Uh, that shows the sort of finished project coming together with the seawall, you know, waiting to be sort of uh, grouted, but it, we're getting there. And you can see now the restoration of the building element to the back of it. And you can see the tree canopies getting stronger as we go. So the lawn in place now, there's fertilizer, there is actually uh, uh, proper soil and there's proper management going on. Um, and there's even some restoration of other elements around it, around the park area, because once other people start to see the park being restored, they had more energy to go and then restore their restaurant or their apartment block or their hotel. So it changed the sort of direction of, of what was happening. So there are the cannons picked up from the police stations in a, in a proper row, like a cannonade, like once was there. You can see the large grass areas of the, of the formal lawns, which are used for you know, picnics and used for general sort of clean, green open space. That's all we wanted to achieve, clean, green, open space. On the other side of the site is the, you can see the sort of pink and, and gray paving. There is the area of the marketplace, which is a multi-purpose place. And that is used for a film festival once or twice a year. It's used for uh, sort of music festivals fairly frequently, but every night it's used for the food market, you can see in the bottom, which is a gas lamp food market. And it, it's incredibly romantic. The, the place changes overnight. I mean, the smell of the cooking food, this is largely all sort of uh, you know, Zanzibari food. There's even a thing called a Zanzibari pizza sitting on the right-hand side, you can see in a big stack. It, very exciting. And this then is something for the locals to actually have a consistent job and a consistent income. It's something for the tourists to contribute to. But everybody goes there and everybody mingles. So it's a shared space. And that's what everybody really wanted. They wanted a sustainable shared space. And that's it a couple of years later after the uh, installation was sort of bedded in and getting going. And I was very happy to go up into the House of Wonders and actually look down on it and see this picture because this gives you an image of what it looked like in the earlier days of when the park had actually been first installed. And that became quite convincing uh, and actually very exciting. And very clean, you might notice. So that was the first phase, which gave us confidence. So then we were moved on by the clients to say, well, take another piece and actually do the, uh, the seafront promenade. So we thought we were confident at the time, let's go. And the area we looked at, but you can see here Foradani Park in the middle. So everything there on the sort of the right-hand side going towards the old dispensary is a long thin piece called Mazingani Road, which is the main route to the port of Zanzibar. It's a terribly thin road. It actually had a broken down sort of seawall. It had a broken down uh, edge to the promenade. And it was also uh, in a terrible state of repair. Uh, and continuously, trucks would go the wrong way down it. So it was, 
It was quite a chaotic place to be. So something had to happen. That's what it used to look like, probably in about the 1920s. You can see the sea wall there. You can see every one of those buildings at the back was a palace at some time or another. And sometime now they've been converted into music buildings and university buildings and one or two of them into hotels. But they literally are, it's, it's, it's walls upon walls of palaces. And that's what makes it a special continuum in this entire seafront. And you can see the House of Wonders at the other end. So definitely worth actually the focus and the effort. So we took that little piece, phase two, and we focused on it. And you can see behind it, you can see the texture of the buildings and the tightness. It's almost like a crystalline urban form behind there. You just go th through into that area through alleys. Uh, they're barely even big enough for, you know, they're not big enough for a car, in fact. They're big enough for two motorbikes to actually get through or a small cart. Um, so it's an incredible um, uh, sh shock when you actually walk out of the narrow, dark lanes of four-story buildings from the back and you pop out onto this seafront, which is bright and sunny, and you're looking out across the blue sea. So the difference between urbanity and the actual sort of sea uh, seafront is is very exhilarating, and it's a it's a very beautiful place. So that's what it looked like in, in 1918 uh, and in 1928. Uh, there was a railway which used to run down here, which I was fascinated by. It was a narrow gauge railway called the Bababoo, a railway line. And what was so nice about that? It was called Bababoo because that's the sound that a train makes. In Zanzibar, it goes boo 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 boo, and it regularly used to run over people. It hardly ever used to stop. It used to move relatively slowly, but still run over people and cause fatal accidents in some cases. And it used to take the sultans all the way through to their holiday palaces further up the coast. So that was quite a feature. And unfortunately, we tried to find it because we thought it still might be on the island, but we heard it had gone to America, bought by some millionaire probably. And uh, we've never managed to find it and get it back. But we did find other things. Um, and you can see in the picture on the right, uh, the left hand side, sorry, that the, uh, the, there used to be palm trees. There used to be some palm trees and some casuarina trees, which is a whistling pine uh, along that edge because it was very windy. And so the idea of not using uh, shade trees there was reinforced by this idea that there are palm trees there anyway, coconut palms then they should become the icon of this walkway, this new promenade. And so that's the direction we went in. Um, we, were, we had to go through a proper uh, planning process for this. So we had to engage again with the municipality and with UNESCO and actually show that we were looking at actually putting physical sea protection in there, which would protect all the palaces behind, because that was the historical um, imperative that we had to protect the heritage but there were many modern things that had to happen there as well because it's, it's, it's used to change. So it wasn't just for commerce or fishing, it was for access and living and studying and working and sitting and parking and everything because everybody does everything outside under a tree in Zanzibar because it's so humid and so uh, egregious from an exercise point of view, you just want to be in the shade. And from the other point of view, there's a, the road, the road this, this road along the edge of the town is very important for tourism, for fishing, for boating, for walking, for diving and swimming off the sea wall, which we've just been repairing, which is, is almost like the most wonderful thing, because it's, it's almost like a swimming pool at high tide, like a Lido, as you would see in this on a French river, it is because it's clean water coming into a relatively dirty area, and it's a very good place to swim and it's very safe. So in fact, we were using these, these planning features to give a bit more character back to the, uh, the very important edge of the city or the town and to get things uh, to work for many different communities. And so um, we, involved, we involved particularly pedestrian routes, swimming routes, boating routes and vehicular routes. And we picked up all the big elements of trees which we've met along the way and any other elements of walls or drainage or physical features or buildings and we built them in. So it's, it's not a perfect job of let's actually have a, a beautiful, simplified, uh, organic route through, through the town. It's a case of respond to what you find along the way. The great big tree, you can see on the bottom right hand corner there, the people tree, which is planted, I, I'm told it says on the sign on it, planted in 1942. I can hardly believe that in, that in those number of years, you get a tree that big, but that's what the sign says. 
and it's enamel, it's an enamel sign. So I imagine it is authentic. But um, nevertheless, we did a special detail on that. You'll see in a moment. This is the plan. And to actually enable this plan to happen, we had to um, be very practical. We had to decide to widen the, um, the route by an extra five meters in order to enable us to put a coffer dam in, to build the wall, to put the new plantings in, and not to actually destroy all the services in the existing road. So we in fact made Zanzibar bigger by five meters all the way along this edge. I think it's the first time I've ever made uh, any country bigger. And it was a very exciting exercise, especially when the storms came in. And that's what it looks like in a section, just to prove that point. So you can see where the, where the lamppost is, is where the old wall was. Uh, and that was the furthest extent to the previous promenade. But we had to do this five metres of land reclamation. And, and one person did actually say to me, where will that water go? Uh, I must admit, I did not have an answer for that. Uh, I couldn't actually work it out from a physics point of view. But nevertheless, it was the only way we could get the wall built. And we, we chose a line for the new line of coconuts to go in. And we worked it out in terms of traffic. And then we actually sort of took the heritage side and we put that in as another layer. And this is what we sort of ended up with, so to give you an idea. So in the corner there, the top, uh, top left-hand corner is an artist's impression of the proposed promenade, which looked quite real to me, and I was totally sort of taken with that. And you can see the palaces on the left-hand side, and you can see this now, this generous promenade, and this very easy uh, way for traffic to go up and down and not jeopardise the, uh, the people using the promenade, which was the big problem before. Um, and what we did do is we actually chose a little piece of wall, of the old wall, to actually cut out surgically and then take up to the new level and put it on top as a remnant or a memory uh, of the old wall. And then I'll show you a picture of that in a second. But that was the artist's impression we drew just to demonstrate this romantic idea of don't let's forget about the past. Let's remind everybody because we need to know where we came from. And, and the rest of it was actually uh, just a generic planning exercise. But what we did do is we actually took a staircase, which is staircase number three in the middle there, and we reconfigured and rebuilt that staircase in the way that it was, but further out uh, to sea. Just to have, again, not, not an authentic memory, but a, a good gesture to actually say, we want to replace what was there. And what's quite funny is many of the people in this area always chose that place to have their family photographs taken or to fish from. So there's so much loyalty around that particular area in the center there, that it was incredible how much buy-in you got from the local people. And if they didn't like what they saw, they came and told you, even if it was a language that you didn't quite understand. But that's my fault for not actually learning Swahili, uh, having been there for so many, so many years. We sold the idea to them because we built a model of it, and everybody loves a model. Uh, and everybody got the idea of the scale of the buildings and the scale of its imposition. And so this unlocked the, uh, the whole project. And we started work. And it was actually, when we started work, we lost a bit of confidence because it almost looked like it was actually too much of an intervention. And had we done the right thing? And because it wasn't finished, it was, there was some nervousness. Uh, everybody was very happy about the fact we kept the big tree, but it was a case of everybody got a bit, a bit nervous about having gone too far. Um, but we carried on. We carried on. We, we re-leveled the beach. So we cleaned the beach and re-leveled the beach with brought in sand because the beach had eroded over a series of years. So we had to build the lost sand back. Why was the sand lost? You can ask. It was lost because the government had built a port with jetties going out just around the corner here where the, uh, uh, the ferries come in. And that changed the way the sea flowed and caused this area to erode. So in fact, this was a combination of repairing the seafront from a beach stabilization point of view and creating this new area of land and the new walkway. And we started to bring in uh, transplant coconuts from the hinterland, from old areas of derelict um, coconut palm areas to bring into the site. And you see there on the picture along the bottom. So and I've always loved uh, transplanting coconuts because they tend to live and flourish and not to die. And there is a memory wall and a boatman's shed. So we tried to pick up some of the local detail. 
There's a piece of the old wall, which we took apart stone by stone, numbering each block from where it was and put it back together. The, the back of that wall is the old wall. And in the front of it is an example of the new wall holding it in place. And there's a couple of dates there. The original wall was 1920 and the other ones are, you know, at a later date in, uh, in when we were actually building it. And that, that suddenly became a place where everybody wanted to go and lean or sit. It became like a social place and it wasn't intended like that. It was just intended to be a passing monument. But if it works, you know, don't knock it. It became very popular and is, is the background to many, many photographs. And even to the point of where the people tree was, there was a derelict um, fisherman's hut, which is often used by the people who take tourists out to store their outboard motors and fuel. And it was such a quaint and decent building that we thought, well, we would have to restore it and integrate it into the site which we did. So in the bottom right hand corner there, you can see a part timber, part tin building, which is very much in the vogue of old Zanzibar and is extremely well used by the fishermen, especially in the rainy season. And it's a vital part of actually keeping real, real, a real economy, a real sea, sea you know, based economy going in that area. So that's uh, that's a before this upgrade. That's what it looked like with people walking on the wall to get out of the trouble. You know, no, no footpath on the other side either because it's actually parked up with cars and hardly any beach in that area and uh, full of rubbish. And then there's a CGI of what somebody with a computer told us it would look like. And I didn't believe in one jot because I don't trust computers. And there's our own reality. And we even went to the point of copying the old street nights, uh, which we had actually reconstructed in South Africa out of cast aluminium, because the character of the lighting at night was so special. And because, because the lighting at night was one of the features of what made Zanzibar famous in its history, uh, this is why it became so special. So we used this, uh, a very yellowish sort of Victorian colored sort of light bulb. Uh, and it was actually very delicate and it gives you a sort of very, I won't say authentic, but a very gentle view of what the actual, uh, the whole sea edge is like at night, especially the, the colour of the beach. And back to the Sultan's Barge, because I mentioned the Sultan's Barge at the beginning, which you saw as a little insect in the picture, because that became the next, next part of the uh, sort of puzzle here, is it, this barge was probably built in uh, India, because it's you've got Indian wood and Indian decoration. But if you look at the sign at the front on a brass plate, it says it was made in the Isle of Wight. And uh, for some strange reason, it had been stuffed in a, in, a, in, a, in a shed in the docks. And we found it, and it was eventually given to the Aga Khan group to restore, which they did with a series of artisans and specialists from Spain. And they cleaned the boat up. It was actually very, very derelict and, 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 and worn when it was actually first uh, found, but it was all cleaned up. The insides were cleaned. All the uh, ornamentation of tropical fruits and exotic things and the canopy were all salvaged. And the ornamentation from around the edge of the boat uh, and all the sort of filigree work around the edge were regilded by these Spanish guys and everything cleaned uh, in the point of being put back together to make a centerpiece in the House of Wonders of a new museum. And you can see there in the, in the central picture, there's, a, there's a, a decorative panel of the colors which the boat would actually be finally painted when it was finished. So this, this restoration was never finished actually, because the whole sort of project started to unbundle at this stage to a certain degree, uh, but this was going to be passed on to the government to continue the restoration of it, because it was seen as being, it's incredible that a, uh, you know, something of this age and something of this construction could have survived in a place like Zanzibar, where all wood disappears. So it's a really amazing find. So my job was to actually collect all the pieces from everywhere I could find them, count them all, photograph them, stick a label on them with a number, just to make sure nothing got lost in transit. It's the only time I've ever done a job like that. And I actually, I loved it. It made me very calm. And so other aspects of Zanzibar. So Zanzibar has got a good and a bad heritage. There was a lot of ignorance of, of slavery in Zanzibar over a long period of time. And it was very little sort of spoken about. 
it was very little sort of um, used as an educational theme or a sort of a, a reality check, uh, as was the actual uh, birthplace of Freddie Mercury. And there was no signage anywhere that actually dedicated itself to explaining what happened where or who lived where or how it actually worked. So this, this, this absence of signage was quite curious. And I was told at one stage that, uh, no in certain terms by a guide, uh, a street guide, that the, certainly Freddie Mercury would never, was never born in, in, in Zanzibar. And uh, there's no question of it. So we now know that not to be true now. And the a rectification process of the story of this place, which was quite exciting for me, because when I started working there, there was very little discussion of even slavery. Um, and UNESCO granted a sum of money to actually develop explanatory signage to actually tell the story of Zanzibar, to tell the st story of slavery, you know, in, in, in numbers and in actual facts in a way that had never been told before. And, and that was actually quite brilliant. And there's a little diatribe there, maybe which I wrote myself for an, another particular project, but this is, 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 is on the idea of this thing that you have to talk about and you have to actually identify in places what happened there before, their purposes, their personalities. It's not enough just to show people a historic building and say, look at that, it was restored. The story behind that has to be told. And it can only be told by, you know, perhaps in landscape architecture or in architecture or in actual tra uh, trained guides. The, the biggest story of, of landscape, the biggest story of people's lives and heritage places has to come out because it helps people to, to evaluate and value them. So this, was, this rang a bell for me because this came after our projects had finished, but it was, it was what was missing and it seriously helped. And just to make it uh, more interesting for me, I, when we finished the projects for both, on both sides, I went to the University of Cape Town and said, you're all whiz kids in geomatics and surveying and whatever, what can we do now to preserve some of this? Because the, 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 the rot, the decay, the degradation will start to happen again eventually. What do we do to fix a point in the sand or a line in the sand to say what we've done? Where, where, where have we taken this? And they said, no, no, we've got these incredible survey machines now and drones and we can fly the site and, and do whatever and rocking a million points per, per entire. Anyway, this is the product. We weren't allowed to take in, in drones because at that stage we would not allow drones in Zanzibar. But what we did do is we took in these rocking surveyors which took millions of points and there were always millions of points were put together. So if ever anything in Zan this Zanzibar seafront fell down, we would know exactly where to put it back, exactly what it was there, what was there before. The little arch in the front just near the pavilion, by the way, is, uh, celebrates the arrival of Princess Anne for a royal visit, you know, I'm not sure, from the 1940s. Um, but all the things we built, the new seats and the, all these areas of the sea wall, that's all recorded in this with the older parts of the, uh, the fabric. So now we've got a, a map forever. If things need to be con constructed or restudied, we've got a, a, base, a base print. Because this is what happens. This is the house of wonders I've been talking about all the time. So what the other day, I mean, not too long ago, on the 25th of December, 2020, it, the whole thing fell down. And it was actually just at the point of being restored by the Japanese team. And in that time, they took to talk about it and to do you know, uh, lists of things and to actually do basic research on it, it fell apart. So you see there some of the cast iron pipes which were actually put in place to create the colonnading uh, when it was rebuilt by the British uh, and actually designed by an engineer. So you never can be sure what's around the corner. Uh, and that's the reason fortuitously, that we didn't actually take shots of this in the radar, uh, the survey that we actually did. So you never know. Uh, sometimes it's best to record your work and then you've got something to actually carry forwards. And that's, that's really all I've got to say. Uh, and I'm very happy to chat to you about other things, but my sort of wisdom that I took away from this very interactive and, and quite emotional experience actually, working in a place where I didn't share the language, the religion or, um, uh, any experience of it, actually, even I had to relearn an entire plant schedule because of the tropical plants I needed to know and trees. It's city living is a shared experience. We all dream of a place in the sun in the morning and a place in the shade in the afternoon. 
everybody enjoys the parks in Zanzibar. Not only the tourists, not only the people who live there, it's a totally shared experience. It's a richer experience because it is a shared space and it's not exclusive. It's not behind a hotel fence. It's actually integrated. And that is the target. That's where society sort of blooms. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I've learned so much. I mean, where to start? Um, I've just been looking at the chat. I see, I think you've stunned everyone into silence. There aren't any questions, but people may have some now. But I mean, things that I've, I've just, you know, found out about were things like the use of coral, amazing. Mm. And landscape regeneration with, with all the trees and things that you had, you know, absolutely incredible. New sea wall. <laughs> and the fact that it was all for such a diverse community as well, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And of course, acknowledging its its um, slave past, which I think obviously is extremely important. Um, and the fact that, you know, there's, this is a very sort of positive way forward for everybody, uh, along with multi use, you know, um, of course, very sad about all the collapse of the buildings, which obviously is, is, is another real problem and, and a separate one, I suppose. Um, which of course um, Commonwealth Heritage Forum, I, I think would probably like to help where they can. Um, <clears throat> and the fact that, you know, you've avoided pastiche with a lot of this as well, I think is, is really amazing um, and all for local benefit. Um, I've learned a new word as well, cannonade. I didn't know that one before, so thank you. <laughs> and you should be very careful. I, I tend to make words up as well. <laughs> So thank you. I won't forget that. Um, and another amazing thing as well is, is the fact that you were able to use roads in a positive way, uh, along with a new foreshore, which, of course, mm. those of us Cape Tonians know all about foreshores. Uh, but this was a really positive experience. Um, and the fact that you were able to use roads as, as, a, as a, you know, a, a, a sort of uniting feature rather than a separating. So I think, you know, those are all things that I've learned from it, which I, I've done far too much talking now. So I see there are some questions in the chat. Jess, do, would you like to? Oh no, they're just, so thank they you. Oh. <laughs> we do have one question from David. How was the project financed with all the different partners? Okay, well, it was in, it was in two phases uh, and the, the first phase was actually financed by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. Uh, and I think with some UNESCO input. Um, and the second phase was actually financed, I think, by the World Bank. Um, the second, yeah, second phase uh, was actually, the initial design of the second phase was actually done for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, but then they were not involved in its execution. So the World Bank then stepped in and I don't know too much of the details, but that ran very smoothly and the project sort of rolled and we used uh, 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 the same contractor for the first phase as well as the second phase. So we had a continuity of understanding of the materials and the artisanal requirements. So in fact, the money was actually, let, let's say was the, the investment in the first phase of the project was as much in education and training as in uh, the final product. And then that could be rolled into the second phase which actually worked brilliantly because there was a continuity then of quality and an understanding, which was actually, um, it, it looks like it was a, a proper historical installation and not patchwork done. As you often see in heritage cities, you get a patchwork occurring when different people do different uh, types of repair work. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask away. Thank you, a great project. Um, I, I, I think it shows that it's not just about the drawing board. It's about the whole process of sensitivity about culture um, and, and engaging with, with various communities. Um, very well demonstrated. Um, thank you very much indeed. It was a pleasure. Um, well, thank you for getting me into this boat, actually. <laughs> we, have, we have a question here from Professor Jay Tempe. Hello, can I ask uh, in person? Can you hear? 
Yes, we can. Please do. Um, I was interested in the issue of slavery and its perception with it by the Zanzibarian people. Um, yes. Am I right in thinking that it was extremely old slavery in Zanzibar and mu much of the slavery was to the Arabian Peninsula? Correct. That's, that, that's right. I mean, basically, um, the... Basically, the slavers were from the Middle East, and they, they chose to live in Zanzibar because it was near the source of their commodity, which would be the slaves, which were brought to the, uh, the coast of Tanzania by um, other people living in that area, and then sold to, for transport to Zanzibar, and then shipped off all over the place, actually, you know, in terms of the slave trade. Um, a particularly sort of a vile industry. Uh, and, you know, and everybody in, in many European countries profited out of slavery for many years. Um, and it was only later on in the British Empire when the British decided no, they wanted to end slavery for whatever their reasons were. Perhaps, you know, they wanted to bankrupt other colonial powers or they just wanted to actually dominate that area. But uh, so they committed themselves to uh, getting rid of slavery. And that actually sort of worked and actually broke down the system of slavery. Um, but it was an integral part of the life in Zanzibar. Most of the main houses, the quite elegant houses you see, were uh, uh, owned by slavers. And if you look in the patterns of the door, you will often see a chain worked in the timber work in carving. So that actually means there was a slave dealer who lived in that particular place. So the entire economy was, in fact, for a long time, uh, an economy of ivory coming from the hinterland of Africa slavery uh, and cloves. And if you had, if you wanted to grow cloves in a, in a place like Zanzibar, well, you needed slaves to actually grow them because they had to pick them and it was a lot of hard, hard handwork to do. Uh, and so it's a bit like cotton in America. Do it for cotton to actually work in the American economy. They also had to have slaves. So this entire slave trade was part of a, an accepted pattern, which is of course entirely unacceptable, uh, especially to us now. But it should have been unacceptable then. It took a very long time for slavery to disappear. I, I've got the date somewhere of when it was banned in the in the British Empire, but it actually took years and years and years for that actually to disappear. It lingered horribly um, yeah, in in sort of various areas. So there's a whole whole there's a whole work of of, of, of uh, research and sort of empathy that needs to go into reviewing the whole idea of slavery and what happened. Because a lot of what I wrote in my notes there, which you probably flicked over too quickly, is what got to me is, and I only found this out relatively recently, and it got to me more than got to me, is I, well, I, I read when the slaves were liberated in England and elsewhere, and, and the, the British slaves in in the uh, yeah, in all different countries, that they actually there was compensation was paid. I remember reading compensation was paid. What I only found out subsequently was compensation was paid to the slave owners for loss of income. And that the slaves were often put into a further period of uh, indenture before they were released, like four years, because they had to pay their way out of slavery. So uh, that's an unheard of fact. Why isn't that written around the bottom of uh, Nelson's column or something like that? Because most people don't know the facts about slavery, and I certainly didn't. Um, perhaps we should all study history more. Thanks very much, for sure. Yes, I think some of these things are beginning to come out now, aren't they, and be talked about more <clears throat> in the last couple of years, and they certainly need to be known. Mm. Um, something else I wanted to ask, what about tourism now that you, obviously these, these works have all taken place and, and that the yes. area is clearly regenerated and vibrant again, is, is tourism on, on the increase then? There, well, it was. Well it, it was actually because because I mean the the, the whole thing uh, this, the whole seafront project was such an uplifting project generally for the state of Stone Town that many other people started new hotels and new restaurants and many other people from uh, other parts of the world started to build hotels in Zanzibar, which is both a good and a bad thing depending on how they build them and where they put them and the scale, but yes there was a great show of confidence, uh, uh, especially from places like um, Italy and Germany and certain countries which are very you know, great sun lovers. And, and this is a very you know, cultural country to go to. You can do incredible snorkeling. 
there's incredible sort of history to go to see and there's incredible food so it's very appealing and it's a straight up and down flight to get there so there's no flying halfway around the world so yes it was booming before covid mm-hmm. and of course covid crushed everything i mean it's it's ruined the sort of tourist economy of most of the places that i work in even even mauritius was set back hugely and they've got a very sound you know tourism industry but if you can't get on a plane safely then you can't go there but i have great faith in Zanzibar to uh, revive itself again. It is a really genuine experience going there. It's not like going to one or two of the more sort of uh, loathsome Spanish um, resorts, which are entirely uh, artificial. Uh, and I like I like Spain and I like parts of Spain and I like parts of Portugal, but the authenticity in Zanzibar, in the food and the people. I will tell you a quick, very quick story. I would, when I first went there, I got totally lost trying to find the back of the House of Wonders. And I, I was trying to find the water's edge. I'd lost the sea, believe it or not, wandering down all those small lanes. And there was a very, very old man sitting on uh, outside one of his doors, his Zanzibar doors. And I went up to him and said to him, excuse me, but I'm lost. Uh, can you tell me which, uh, how do I to get to the sea? Meaning, you know, the waterfront uh, where I was working. And he looked at me and he said in a very sort of, you know, sage voice young man this is an island the sea is all around us and i thought my god he's rehearsed that many times and that quality in interaction with people in the street stunning when you eat their food it's stunning zanzibar pizza wonderful no matter what the side effects later on they're worth it well, thank you very much. I hope we've whetted everybody's appetites now to go and, and see it. And uh, the, the talk will go online so that if anybody would like to watch it again, it will be there. Um, have we got any more questions, Jess, before um, we... I've just posted in the chat where you can um, listen to um, any of the previous talks, and this talk will also be put up there. Um, should we finish with one last question from Marianne? Um, she just asked, when um, did you undertake these two projects and how long did they take um, to complete? Sure, now you're asking. Look at, it, look at this grey hair. Um, I'm uh, probably... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be actually... Uh, I'm not going to give you the wrong information. It was probably about nine years ago. No, probably more than that. So my, my, my secretary is sitting next to me. She's telling me it's actually more than that. So it's probably about 10 or 12 years ago. And I started probably about 20 years ago. I'm much, I'm much older than I look. I think, thank you. Yeah, I'm well, sorry I can't you. be more accurate, but you know, the memory. Uh, thank you so much. It's been an amazing talk, um, and I'm sure everyone's really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us all. A pleasure. Yes, I'll, thank you. I'll see you all again in England, I hope. Indeed. Uh, I might see you in Cape Town in the meanwhile. <laughs> I, would definitely, I would definitely see you in Cape Town. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been absolutely fascinating. And um, Hopefully everybody can watch it again and hopefully everyone will now go and visit Zanzibar. It certainly inspired me. So great. Lovely. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye then. Bye.